we've had three really stimulating papers and really entertaining papers. I'm afraid the entertainment stops now. <laughs> Not only have I got no slideshow for you, uh, I'm afraid it's going to be kind of fairly heavy duty stuff. It seems in comparison to what we've had almost like a kind of Methodist sermon. And like a Methodist sermon, I have a text. And my text is this. If anybody's seen it, it's a draft report from uh, the Commission on Civil Law Rules on Robotics to the European Parliament. It was published about 10 days ago. Uh, it's a great paper, actually, it's a good read. Uh, it talks a little bit about the various forms of uh, mechanization that there are, about, about the role of robotics and things like <coughs> health technologies and driverless cars and so on and so forth, and actually provides a really good overview of some of the ethical and legal issues involved in that. But the most eye-catching thing which any press reports that there were picked up on was the idea of rights for robots, a charter for robot rights, which is frankly a bit silly. But that's, that, that's where I want to start with that and come back to that at the end, perhaps. But before I go on to talk a little bit more about what exactly the algorithmic self as citizen is, um, can I just make it quite clear what an algorithm is from my point of view? It's something we haven't really talked about properly. I'm going to start off with the definition which Hill provided in an article in Philosophy and Technology from uh, 2015. Uh, the formal definition of an algorithm is a mathematical construct with, quote, a finite, abstract, effective compound control structure imperatively given, accomplishing a given purpose under given provisions. Okay, very technical definition. I'd also like to, though, involve a kind of machine learning element into that. So what I'm talking about is an algorithm which also is, uh, will, will be self-teaching. And I also want to introduce a notion, the lay understanding of the algorithm uh, also includes into that implementation of a mathematical construct a, a notion of a technology, an application of the technology configured for a particular task. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about algorithms. So, onto the paper itself, and like a Methodist sermon, I've got three parts. The first part, I want to look at the creation of a new governable subject, which is the biggest part, I think. And then I want to think a little bit about the exclusion of participation that's involved in that as a result of what you might term the inscrutability of algorithms. And then finally, spend a few moments just raising some questions about what form should or could resistance to this take. So to start off the first bit, I'm going to argue there's a new form of knowledge emerging here and with it a new form of power and a new subject of governance. Antoinette Rouveret uses the term data behaviorism to cope with the, the idea of to cope with the complexities of a world of massive flows of persons, subjects and information. And to compensate for the difficulties of governing by law in a complex, globalized world. The implicit belief accompanying the growth of big data is that provided one has got access to massive amounts of raw data from the Internet of Things, as well as from commercial and government data sets, one might be able to anticipate most phenomena, including human behaviors, in the physical and digital worlds. Relatively simple algorithms could allow us on a purely inductive statistical basis to build models of behavior or patterns without having to consider either causes or intentions or formally expressed preferences. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Here, knowledge is not produced about the world anymore, but from the digital world. An algorithmic reality is formed inside a digital reality, but without any direct contact with the world that it's aimed at representing. This is a notion of shadow selves who exist within data. Now, it doesn't really matter if this kind of way of approaching things actually works or not, actually is accurate and provides a way of handling the world, but it does seem to provide a wholly new, apparently comprehensive, seemingly undeniable and, I argue, undoubtedly irresistible form of governance, if you like, an algorithmic governmentality. And from this emerges the algorithmic state. State agencies have begun to realise the power and the potential of big data, 
data mining, of profiling, of algorithmic decision making. If Facebook and Google can develop predictive algorithms, if Amazon, Netflix analyzes, well, why not the police, the health system, the education system? In fact, why shouldn't all regulatory and enforcement agencies jump on the algorithmic bandwagon? If we want to manage the production of justice, judicial administration, why not develop a predictive algorithm? I'm just starting a little bit of work on how judges might use algorithms or how we might use algorithms instead of judges. Uh, if we care about child welfare, or shouldn't the agencies develop a predictive algorithm there? If we're interested in tax evasions, road design, construction, all sorts of things, why not embrace this algorithmic turn? What is different here is that this algorithmic governmentality works without any relation to any individually experienced real world, with any real experiences, without any messy politics. It is without subject. It operates with infra-individual data and supra-individual patterns without at any moment calling the subject to account for him or herself. This algorithmic gov governmentality draws upon and seeks to involve governable subjects who function not as real individuals, but rather as temporary aggregates of this infrapersonal data, which is gathered at and exploitable on an industrial scale. The knowledge that algorithmic government draws upon isn't created by individuals or given any meaning by natural observable categories or by political or other frames of reference. Instead, it appears to appear ineluctably from the data it's to be found present, although hidden, of course, in the big data. It creates a new and constantly updated reality. And with that, a new normality that's being reinforced by seemingly being the expression of everyone. Everyone's in this. In this sense, the world of algorithmic government is something that is not comprehensible naturally. There's no self or individual or relationship with a natural or real world as presently understood by us. And at the same time, it seems to offer a false emancipation by appearing by its very nature to be all inclusive. Now what I'm suggesting here perhaps appears a bit futuristic, this kind of seamless world out there constructed without our knowledge. But data, it seems, from the Internet of Things offers the potential at least of a totalized vision of movement and behavior, of spending and consuming, as well as of communicating and accessing various resources. The promise of algorithmic government means that the project of government is changing. It's now about predicting and responding to predictions within this digital world that exists uncoupled from natural experience. This produces what might be termed, and following Foucault directly here, a new truth regime. And it's one which is centered around what is visible from the data. Data mining here reorganizes how we see the world with the compelling certainty of science and statistics. The task is to construct meaning out of meaningless information. And this involves the disappearance of the individual subject, whose only point of interest is how he or she resists sorry, exists in a relational context with other individuals as they themselves appear massed up into huge data sets, how their conduct affects each other and so forth. This, I think, involves the departure of individual agency and also, it seems to me, the disappearance of politics. The machine, the computer says, there's no kind of, kind of you know, what do we want? The computer says, it knows what we want, it knows what we're doing. This would certainly suggest the disappearance, or at least the transformation, of traditional forms of policy making. Consultation in all its forms, even internet enhanced through the reach and immediacy of technology and Web.2 technologies, becomes obsolete when every action and behavior is already known, is already predictable from the huge data sets. Why would you bother consulting about a transport system beyond broad issues of do you want one 
when you know about traffic flows already, you know the cost people are prepared to pay, to bear, how and when public transport becomes acceptable and so on and so forth. Now, this seems to me to be different from the traditional government, even government through the project of statistics, which as you all know was a hugely powerful governmental technique from the late 17th century onward. People like Ian Hacking and so forth have shown us the power of statistics in a governing um, uh, process. But this does not produce the average or typical citizen as an object of government. And that, the idea of producing the average or typical citizen invites people to say, well, I'm not the average one. I'm an exception. That's not me. That's not us. That's something different. And you get into debate about that. It's not accurate. It's not me or whatever. But this seems to offer a universally valid way of rendering the world meaningful. It doesn't require further testing to see if this or that hypothesis is true or right or acceptable. It simply is. And if you claim you're not reflected in the data, that's not me, then you're simply added in. And from the resultant now improved data, the algorithm appears even more valid. As Rouveret puts it, in the context of data mining and profiling, patterns and profiles are not merely competing with testimony, expertise, discourses of authority or confession. They make linguistic modalities of evidence appear obsolete compared to the operationality, immediacy, and objectivity of data behaviorism. Now this produces a new kind of citizen, a new sort of governable subject. And it's something different from the usual citizen within liberal or neoliberal assemblages. Their government involves reacting to the average, or to a category, or a community, which is deductively created as an object of governance. So, for example, you'd have something like at-risk patients, and should we devise a health strategy for them? You'd have suspect communities, and the question is, should we surveil them? And individuals may or may not fit into these governing categories, and the categories may or may not be entirely accurate ways of seeing the world and its problems. Individuals who drink too much coffee are not necessarily more likely to develop heart disease. Young men who attend a mosque every day are not necessarily more prone to terrorist conversion. Reducing taxation for the wealthy may or may not result in trickle-down benefits for the poor. And of course, individuals can be wrongly labelled, they can buck the trend and so forth. Furthermore, the hypotheses as well as the facts generated uh, as, as well as the facts and the policies generated by these facts can be challenged on political grounds. We don't want this. We don't, you know, we want something else. We want our money spent on something else. But these issues don't arise within an algorithmic governmentality. It is instead, apparently, dealing only with a reality. So in this way, algorithmic governmentality is without a subject. It operates, as I said, with infra-individual and uh, data and supra-individual patterns without at any moment calling upon the subject to account for him or herself. The only subject algorithmic governmentality needs is a unique supra-individual constantly reconfigured into a statistical body. And this is made of this infra-individual digital traces of impersonal, disparate, heterogeneous, individualized facets of daily life and interactions. This infra and super individual statistical body carries with it a kind of memory of the future, as Rouveret puts it. And the purpose and the role of algorithmic governmentality consists in either ensuring or preventing the actualization of this future. That's all government's about. It's about ensuring or preventing the, the, the future which is built into this analysis of this, this huge data. As Rouveret puts it, a memorable phrase, algorithmic governmentality does not need to tame, quote, the wilderness of facts and behaviours. In other words, it's not government saying, how can we act upon the world? Let's look at the world. Let's decide what needs to be done. Let's ask people what needs to be done. It's there. It's just there. The com this computational turn renders persons and situations immediately and operationally meaningful through their automatic subsumption into future opportunities or risk, the patterns or profiles. It doesn't need the 
interpretive detour of a trial or process or even the concrete material confrontation or encounter with the actual objects or persons concerned. You don't need to t ask people what do you want because you know. You know from the data what they are and what they want. This means that we don't need participation. It seems to me we don't need politics anymore. This is very much in contrast to the individualistic citizen within liberal theory, the autonomous rational man, the man of law, to whom the state addresses commands or nudges towards optimal behaviours as decided through an essential political process as to what we, society, government or whatever, value. Is it real? This vision I've given you of the computer says, the computer knows. I said before it doesn't really matter if these claims are technically true or not, insofar as they seem to provide a wholly new, apparently comprehensive, seemingly undeniable and undoubtedly irresistible form of governance. This algorithmic governmentality, it exists by itself. And of course they're not real. Of course it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Dalton, Thatcher and Taylor are attempting to in initiate a, a debate about critical data studies. For example, they focus on the spatial nature of data, as well as emphasising its very often its commercial context, to suggest that it's not quite as seamless as it may appear. There are cracks, there are spaces for resistance and alternatives. So, for example, they highlight the historical variability of the processes of data production and accumulation, and how in turn this results in an uneven development of data. They use the example of comparing the data sphere in London with that of Mauritius. And they say that the user in each place has got a qualitatively different existence in the digital world. They say, for example, there are more Wikipedia users in the Netherlands than in the whole of Africa. So it's, it's different. We, we, the, the digital reality is different. It's a bit like the, old, the earlier debates were about digital divide and so forth. It's, it's saying there's a massively divergent digital life and experience in different contexts. And of course, I would point out that most data is generated in commercial contexts where its correspondence with reality is less important than whether or not it makes its potential for profit, shall we say. So it's not even accurate. So for people like Dalton, Taylor and, and, and Thatcher, the, the project is to uncover who is missing, what's missing, who's missing. And that's the most important thing for their point of view. They also say certain populations are overrepresented, such as, unsurprisingly, tech industry men in Silicon Valley. We know everything we want to know. We know more than we'd ever want to know about them, including their, their sex lives and so forth. Uh, while others remain completely opaque to outsiders. All that's true, but I think a more important question is, and this is my coming to the end, how do we resist this? We all, I hope, know the Foucauldian aphorism, where there is power, there is resistance. And sometimes it's kind of hard to see where the resistance is in this project of algorithmic governmentality. There is the ubiquity of our enmeshment within big data. John Danaher has written uh, about the opacity of big data. How do we get into it? How do we actually get into this and start to resist it? Rob Kitchen, in a very good article, which, I'm, which I recommend to you all, from, uh, it's just published in 2017 in Information Communication Society, uh, the title is Thinking Critically About and Researching Algorithms, which is a hugely challenging article. It looks at six ways in which you approach this. You try and get into this stuff and they're all a bit, 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 bit hard, to be honest with you. Um, but part of it, a lot of it, involves looking at the ethics of algorithms. And this seems to me to be a hugely important issue. How do we build in ethics? We've had a little bit of discussion about this this morning. I could testify about a project I'm involved with uh, at Queen's. We have a, um, a huge grant for PhDs. In a, I spoke about this I think in the summer as well. Uh, it's called the Leverhulme Interdisciplinary Network in Cybersecurity which involves us working with um, our very good cybersecurity software engineering department on joint PhDs. And one of the difficulties, is, I should say they're, they're all charming and, and it's, it's huge fun and so forth, but one of the difficulties is trying to suggest 
to the software engineers that there are ethical dimensions to their work. They think, well, it works. What, what, what do you want? What's this ethical stuff? They, they just genuinely don't even think of this stuff. Their task is to make the algorithm work. They're guys who are devising missiles, autonomous uh, missile systems and so forth. And you're talking about ethics. They go, what? Yeah, what's that? Um, I'm trying to organize a project with the Royal Irish Academy to try and bring ethicists and um, uh, technicians together to try and uh, suggest that there is a different dimension. So if anybody's interested in that, let me know. Other ways of resistance. Well, lawyers, and I am a lawyer, tend to focus on controlling the executive, controlling government, developing a set of rules. And there are various suggestions around things like an algorithmic court, which should be, you know, comprised of judges who've studied computer science and well-versed in programming and algorithms which might be a good idea, but it's not terribly realistic, I don't think. Uh, a, a better idea might be to establish a government agency whose role is to supervise and implement uh, the uh, role of algorithms, to, to check them, to kind of kite mark them or whatever. Uh, what are the chances of that? Uh, not good. But harnessing even the, how the executive views algorithms, never mind the commercial world, doesn't address the issue now of who is in the executive, who is, who is government. Is government developing the algorithmic technology in-house or is it giving this role to big tech companies? If it's the latter, and it probably is, it certainly is, then the problems are slightly different. There are issues about capture of the state, uh, obviously, but there are other issues too. And it seems to me this new algorithmic ecosystem raises unique legal challenges. If big tech companies are heavily involved and will get increasingly more involved in government, and of course governments define the new ways, this means we have to redefine the public-private divide in novel ways. Without the traditional mechanisms of policy formation from consultation, elections, and other political processes, that's all gone now, the industry would become so deeply enmeshed in policy formation processes that it would challenge the very boundaries of the traditional state. The state will disappear in this. There'll be, new, there'll be a new algorithmic state which will not look like the existing state. So I suggest it's better not to concentrate on trying to control the machinery of government, but instead focus on, their, on its outputs and their impacts on us. So what I'm going to suggest, going back to the European Parliament report, is a bill of digital rights not for the robots, but for us. That's what we need. Thank you.